And welcome everybody to uh, Aspetuck's Land Trust Lunch and Learn series. Uh, I'm Mary Ellen LeMay, I'm the director of the landowner engagement uh, for Aspetuck Land Trust, and I'm the moderator for today's program. Uh, joining uh, me is my colleague Shana Meyer, who is the uh, data and marketing manager for the Aspetuck Land Trust. So she is uh, behind the scenes uh, managing our technology for today. Um, so my role at the Land Trust is to inspire people to change the way they manage their yards, to try to improve biodiversity. And if that means attracting more pollinators, insects, birds, and other wildlife, um, they all share the earth with us. And we wanna welcome them into our yards. Uh, through programs like this Lunch and Learn, and through demonstration sites that Aspetuck has showing what our native plants look like, and through our native plant sale, we're encouraging people to stop using pesticides, plant more natives, and rethink our lawns. Uh, we're in, a in for a treat today as we welcome Suzanne Thompson to share with us her years of experience and best practices for removing invasive plants from our landscape, mostly by understanding how to cut off the life forces that these aggressive plants are using to push out our important native plants. This is our sixth in a series of lecture. Actually, you know what? I think this is our seventh uh, lunch and learn uh, in the series. And um, we're trying to inspire people to improve biodiversity in our region by making these small changes in our yards and gardens. Before we get started and people are still streaming in here, um, I'd like to share some housekeeping details that will allow us to have a seamless webinar experience today. This program will be recorded. So if you can't stay on for the whole time, uh, and, but you've registered, we will be sending you a recording. Uh, if you have questions, they'll be collected in the chat on your lower screen and uh, we will curate them and ask uh, Suzanne the questions after she finishes her presentation. So please use the chat icon instead of the raise hand icon. Okay, um, and since this is a webinar, the speaker and panel will not be able to see or hear the audience. So you can crunch away at your lunch to your heart's delight. We won't hear you. Um, uh, so our speaker today is Suzanne Thompson from Old Lyme, Connecticut. Suzanne has been gardening and battling invasives in Connecticut for the last 20 years. She has a bachelor's degree in urban horticulture and journalism from Kansas State University. She is a Yukon master gardener and a Connecticut NOFA accredited organic land care professional. And she also serves on the board of Mountain Laurel chapter of Wild Ones, a national organization that advocates native plants in the landscape. She's also the co-leader of Pollinate Old Lime and a member of the Town of Old Lime Solid Waste and Recycling Committee. Um, and Suzanne was in the past also the host of a radio show called Connecticut Outdoors on WLIS, Old Saybrook and Middletown. So I am just delighted to have Suzanne here today with us. Um, sit back, enjoy your lunch. Let's take some notes on what we learned from Suzanne today. So uh, Suzanne Thompson, you can take it away. Okay, let me share my screen here. And there we go. Hopefully we'll get going here. I am coming to you from bucolic Old Lyme, Connecticut, where the Wi-Fi and electricity sometimes are not reliable. So <laughs> if anything happens, hold on and we'll, be, we'll get me right back. Um, the beautiful plants that you see behind me are actually skunk cabbage from the Whalebone Cove up in Lyme, which is still part of the Silvio Oconte Nature Refuge. And that picture was taken in uh, mid-May a year ago. So yeah, I don't think the skunk cabbage is quite that far along this year at this time. But I thought that that would be a fitting backdrop for me here. And I, I'm so excited to be able to speak to you guys today. And I'm really pleased to see all of the emphasis that's being given in these recent months, maybe since COVID started, there's just been so many good programs and webinars, and now we're opening back up and there will be tours and, and field trips that are looking at nature and plants from the standpoint of ecosystems. 
not just that plant that pops in the corner of your yard or that you're trying to keep up with the neighbors. It's very much more about, hmm, what's going on here? What's the larger dynamic? Are we seeing climate change? And why are these things popping up in my yard that I never noticed before? So I, I could talk all day about this. I'm gonna to try to keep myself to an hour and so we have uh, time for questions. But I'm gonna give you the Kansas farmer's daughter version of the, the panel discussion on March 31st that Aspetuck Land Trust put on. If you haven't listened to that, go back and listen to the panel of experts there. Uh, if you, it, some of the things I'm going to say are going to resonate and build on top of that, but I think they'll make sense on their own if you haven't heard those other panelists yet. We know that we have invasive plants in our habitats around us, and we do believe increasingly they are thriving. And I do think it is because we're seeing climate changes and shifts. We have a longer summer, fall season here in Connecticut. You can see some of my favorite bad actors here, mugwort. Uh, along with, um, um, and we've got mugwort, multiflora, rose coming in, some dead, dried out knotweed, and um, honeysuckle, Japanese honeysuckle on one side. In the middle is a big patch of mile a minute vine that we discovered at the other end of my development last summer, so I'm still in shock and trauma, and good old bittersweet strangling trees here. So, it goes back to why do we get outside with plants and why do we garden? And I have to say that everything I ever learned about gardening and plants came from my father, Willard Shaw. May he rest in peace. Uh, he never met a plant out of place. He never really met a weed. So you can see why he kind of grew everything together. He spent his final days in Eastern Kentucky quite confused with the red dirt over there after years of growing up in Kansas and gardening. But it's been an interesting evolution for me as I return to my roots and do a lot of gardening things, um, how right he was uh, to begin with. And some of the trends and fads and traditional things that we do in horticulture and landscaping today uh, really, uh, they, we need to get away from those. And hopefully some of the ideas and things I talk about will take us closer to natural habitats again, because that's kind of where I learned it. And of course, Sydney Edison, a great Connecticut garden writer, um, she's aged with wisdom and, and helps us all figure out how to be gardening later in life as well. But the, I, had, I started out studying horticulture, took off into corporate communications, worked on Capitol Hill, actually spent 10 years working for the agricultural chemical industry. Uh, and no, you know, some people say, oh, you worked for the evil empire. Well, I had a background in horticulture. Uh, I had worked on Capitol Hill and done legislative support staff work on at least one major farm bill and the reauthorization of FIFRA, the Fungicide and Denticide and Rodenticide Act. I think they might have changed the name of that now, but it is the law that oversees the use of registration and use of pesticides in, in our country. Um, my corporate marigold line, merry-go-round life ended here in Connecticut when I was doing horticultural communications, not horticultural communications, employee communications for Pfizer's R&D branch. And um, since I'm not from here, as many people pointed out to me, you're really not from New England, are you? Um, <laughs> I said, oh, I have an acre yard now, <clears throat> a suburban house. You tell me what I should be growing here. So in 2002, they said, well, you definitely want barberry. The deer won't eat it. It'll keep pesky neighbors from crossing into your yard too. Mugle pines are popular. The deer might eat those. Um, skip the native dogwood. The Coosa dogwood is more disease resistant. And vinca grows very well here. Um, lots of viburnums. You got to get the Korean spice bush one because of the fragrance. Pachysandra, it's our ground cover um, that we all grow. And uh, there's lots of pretty vines with purple seeds on them. You might want to check into some of those. The deer won't eat those either. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> 
you tell me, you know, I, I don't understand the soil pH or the growing conditions in New England. I didn't grow up with trees overhead. So I'll plant what you guys suggest. Oh, and then there's also plenty of uh, that purple flower Japanese spirea uh, all over the yard. So the light bulb went off a couple of years ago and I started taking an inventory going, oh my gosh, my yard is 80% not from here. Um, no wonder nothing is eating it. Although the deer kept popping through and nipping certain things. And I still found deer ticks around and I had voles around. I had popped in some juniper trees because I knew those from Kansas. And I, I started to get back to my roots and started studying and paying attention to things that I had learned years ago. But then I went on and like I said, became a corporate crap, a busy family person, taking kids to soccer games. Um, and I kind of needed to keep up with the neighbors in my suburban neighborhood with one acre lots and yards. But I went back and took the Master Gardener program. I started doing this radio show on WLIS and WMRD. And through that, I met Bill Dusing, interviewed him. He did radio shows in the past. And of course, Bill's the founder of CT NOFA and the organic land care program uh, that they run. So we, we all miss Bill, but, but a great wise source of information. Interviewed some other eccentric Connecticut gardeners, Thomas Christopher, as well as Nancy DeBrule Clemente. And P.D. Reed, whose name will come up here in a few minutes again when I talk more about knotweed, I began to realize, wait a minute, we really kind of have this all wrong. Um, I'm fighting nature constantly in my yard, and I'm paying way too much for mulch. I did not plan to garden mulch. I want to garden plants. And there's all these pretty things popping up underneath the trees on the perimeter of my yard, which is all just bare and sunny and grassy. I need to be planting some trees and doing some things. I want some shade, semi-shade in my yard. And one thing led to another. I started working with the Save the Sound organization. I'm an outreach coordinator to try to protect 236 acres of coastal forest that a developer owns that's right next to the Oswegatchie Hills Nature Preserve. And we hope long-term that we can combine those two pieces of land and have a full 700 acre contiguous coastal forest in East Lyme, right above the Niantic River. Uh, we have two thirds of it now already. And it's been, been, they have been fighting for 20 years to try to protect the other uh, 236 acres. So with all of that going on in my life, uh, I was asked to help coordinate pollinate old Lyme, which I said, of course, I'm a frustrated garden writer. COVID has hit. We can't congregate. We can't get together in garden club meetings. So let's go remote. Thing I realized was that Governor Lamont in one of his first executive orders when COVID restrictions came in said gardening and outdoor work is an essential activity. So we realized that if we put on our masks, stood six feet apart from each other and acted like a professional garden crew, <laughs> the groups of us could get together in 2020 outdoors. And, and, and that's what we did. So of course I came across Doug Tallamy in my, um, odyssey of moving forward and reading whatever I could about gardening and nature. There have been a lot of other people mentioning the same concepts and ideas, Larry Weiner being one of those, but certainly all hail Doug tell me that he has brought us together and really changed the focus and the intent of what we're doing with our yards and landscapes. Instead of us battling nature, we are the environment now. We're the, the biggest agronomic agricultural crop in the United States is the American lawn. When you look at the amount of fertilizers and water used on it, and that's not a food crop. That's just a vanity crop. Um, we can be doing things differently. And he's pointed out, we need to be doing things differently. And our yards will be more enjoyable if we do things differently. So certainly you probably heard of, of Doug and his books, and I encourage you to keep following along with what he and other experts keep putting out there for us. As the panelists talked um, a couple of weeks ago, a lot about what is an invasive plant. Now, there are disgusting plants that we don't like, but just because we as humans don't like them doesn't mean that they are not, um, they're not invasive. They could be a native thug, they could be a native weed or plant. 
Um, so the concept is something is native because it comes from the continent you're on. And that means it's got that whole ecosystem around it. Something eats it, it supports something else. There are definitely some fungus or insects somewhere that are breaking it down and it rots and goes back into the soil. Plants down south are shifting further north as we see temperatures rising. So they, they kind of can translocate, they can move in. And then every once in a while we have a horrible killer cold weekend like we did a few weekends ago and the crepe myrtles are dinged, you know, by 20 degree temperatures in March, but they're on the move, but, but they're native to our continent. And some of those plants grow a little too aggressively. So instead of saying, ooh, that's invasive, we gardeners say, that's a thug, that's a brute, that's aggressive. So if something is invasive, it doesn't fit in our natural ecosystem and it has not enough or no predators. It doesn't support the food chain. So as they talked about um, on the last panel, there are the criteria that what technically makes something invasive and it, they're prolific. I know as a master gardener, they would talk about, let's see, it's got to spread by seeds, roots, rhizomes, all of these different things. Some plants, it is predominantly through seeds. Others like knotweed, they produce every which way, it, vegetative and seeds, and it's very frustrating. Some of them have an allelopathic effect, which means that they put out enzymes that actually stop other plants from growing, just like native black walnut will put out juglums and you can't grow tomatoes underneath your walnut trees. So, and then there are noxious weeds in Kansas. I think we had poster contests when I was a kid to draw the 11 noxious weeds, or maybe there's 14 now, I forget. The thing is this, take some time to learn the differences, what's native, how it fits into our ecosystem and what's strangling us. So poison ivy is native birds like the seeds. That's why it keeps spreading around. It's an important food for them. It's not so good for humans. So stay away from it if it bothers you. Travel with your tech new soap or something like that. Or jewelweed, the native plant, is a natural antidote. I'm told, I'm not tried it, I carry the tech new, um, to, to poison ivy. So if you get some poison ivy on you, you see some jewel weed growing by there. That's the ones with the orangey flowers when the pretty turquoise seeds that go flying out in, this, in August. Scrunch that up, wad that onto your arm and see if that will counteract the poison ivy. Again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not telling you that's how to do it, but in a pinch, give it a try. Um, and I promise to do some more research on does it really work? <laughs> but um, the other thing is notice that the growth habitat of poison ivy. It runs up the side of the tree. Look at bittersweet. It strangles the tree. It grows over the tree. It drags it down. Asiatic bittersweet is invasive. It's like the kudzu of the north. If you go down into Appalachia in the southeast, it's always so sad to see how the kudzu has grown over trees and then everything just dies underneath the kudzu. Here, with the winds, the bittersweet helps pull the trees down. And don't confuse it with, uh, or either of them, don't confuse them with Virginia creeper, which is a native plant. It's a little aggressive. You might not want it growing up some of your trees or your brick walls, it'll eat out your mortar, but it is a lovely native plant and beautiful colors to it. It just needs to be in the right places. So don't feel bad if you, have to cut your Virginia creeper back, just don't eradicate it, okay? Another one is raspberries. Wineberry is disgusting. The fruits, it's really kind of pretty. It's the, the bluish green one over here on, on my left. Um, the fruits are not that good. They're not that juicy and luscious. Whereas red raspberries, which are native, the fruit's a heck of a lot better. And it doesn't have doesn't have quite the growth habitat taking everything over. Your commercial raspberries that you might grow in a grocery store or probably a high or a big box store or order them from a garden center um, or them online a lot of times, that's are probably a hybrid of European and North American raspberries. But we're going to talk about how to deal with, with wine berry in just a minute. 
The other thing is I, I feel very lucky. I don't see any porcelain berry around me, but at the town transfer station where I like to hang out and take pictures of things in the wood pile and then pop them up into iNaturalist to tell me what I'm really looking at, I noticed this Irish ivy, Hedra hibernica, which is a cousin of Hedra helix, the English ivy. Technically it's not invasive in New England but yet, but it is in some parts of the Southeast and definitely in Oregon. I mean, it's, it's gorgeous, but it strangled this big tree, um, which again, we should think of some North American vines that we can grow instead. Other beautiful blueberries will show up on silky dogwood, which is a shrub, it's not a vine, but we spotted those in an area that we're rescuing and taking back the knotweed from. So it's so much easier to learn how to identify plants now than way back when I was in college. We actually had to use plant keys. If the leaves are alternate, go here. If they're opposite, go there. If the bark looks like this, go here. If the buds go there. All you have to do now is download an app, take a picture, and you can bring them back home. You can load them up in the field if your Wi-Fi is working out there. And you can just spend all the time you want, or not, um, researching different plants. I love iNaturalist. It's free. It's been around for decades. It has a light version called Seek. And the cool thing about iNaturalist is that you can upload the picture. You can guess what it, it'll tell you what it thinks it is. And you can concur or not based on what's found around you. And then a real life person, a naturalist, is going to sooner or later on their volunteer time, come back and confirm that plant for you. And I've actually had some fun chats in the middle of winter with different naturalists going, oh, yes, <laughs> I thought that's what that was. Here's the habitat it was growing in. It's in this nature preserve over here. So there are so many sources out there. Uh, especially at Audubon Society, you can plug in your zip code and it'll tell you what grows around you and what birds it attracts. So uh, it's not about what pops in your yard anymore. Um, it is about what supports the wildlife that you want to have in your yard. And Wild Ones Organization, a national organization, is a wonderful resource as well. So you can also find online great information and, and IDs of invasive species, not just plants, but also insects, clams, and other things from a number of sources. But you know, USDA is the mothership. You also have SIPWIG here is an information network which does carry and post the invasive plant list that the Kinetic Invasive Plants Council determines. And I keep finding the 2018 PDF online. I need to find the 2020 PDF online, but you can get an electronic listing of all the invasive plants and good links to fact sheets. So let's, let's boil it down. Since we have 96 invasive plants in Connecticut and that's just too many for anybody to deal with, let's focus on the most annoying ones in your backyard. And thank you to Emmett for putting together this plant management calendar of the top 10 invasive plants. You can readily find that. There are good presentations on that. And I, I'm sure we'll continue to update with information about how to control invasive species different practices that can be used and, and that information will be updated. Another great speaker who's uh, had a very busy past couple of years is Peter Picone. And if you need to find an old video of his, he did a great program for the Lime Land Trust. It's on their YouTube channel, what to plant, what not to plant. And I love his line, we can all make a difference one plant at a time. I know you can get into some Facebook group chats on invasive and native plants and you'll have all sorts of discussions from people about, oh, you're just wasting your time or we just, eh, you know, the world is changing. Um, no, there are areas that we can and need to protect. There are habitats that we need to help. And we probably have been the biggest, baddest actor in distorting those habitats in the first place. Uh, you know, human beings are, are the most invasive species of all, and we've been able to move things the farthest around the world uh, between airplanes <laughs> and boats and our own feet. Uh, you can't just blame it on wild animals. Um, it, it, it's us. You know, we love to collect and move plants around. 
close to home for me in the lower Connecticut River Valley, I like to refer to the Connecticut River Coastal Conservation District's invasive plants in your backyard brochure. And I'm so excited. Their new edition that came out in 2020 is up to 20 plants. It was 16 before. But you can download this uh, um, from their website. They have printed the newest copy. You might find some in local libraries or you can, at least in, in the Connecticut River Coastal Conservation District, you can contact Jane Browerman and staff and see if you could get more reprints of it. But what I love about this little handy booklet is that it shows you these plants at different stages of their life. And then it also talks about controls. Their philosophy and approach is mechanical first and realize that chemical may need to be an option. So they address both, but start with the mechanical and they give a list of native alternative plants. It'd be a much bigger booklet if they put saying the pictures of the alternative native plants, but you can find those at other places. So if you are feeling overwhelmed from all of the stuff that I've just rattled off and all of the links I've rattled off, I, I just wanna step back, enjoy this plant picture with me. Um, but I loved to find out, I'm a, a member of the Garden Writers of America. I have been for years. We rebranded ourselves and updated our name. We're now Garden Calm. And we hold the Garden Calm conference every year when we can, like Comic Con, only it's Garden Calm. They've done market research and people um, revere gardeners. And a lot of people who work with plants, garden with plants go, oh, I'm not really a gardener. And I just want to say that um, <laughs> if you put your hands in the soil and you deal with plants, you're gardening. You're a gardener. That's okay. And real gardeners kill off plants by mistake as well as intentionally. And real gardeners plant the wrong plants in the wrong place sometimes and have to move them to other places. And that's okay. Real gardeners are actually very humble people. Uh, we love to opine and give suggestions but um, we're not that intimidating. We don't know everything. So the other thing you have to realize is your landscape is going to change over time, just like you and your kids and your pets do. Things grow, things go through unruly stages, and then things go into senescence. And, and uh, <laughs> sometimes they put out wonderful flushes of flowers in those final years. Uh, look at some lovely old apple trees and things. And as we're trying to show ourselves and trying to learn and be understand better, plants and animals, uh, organisms go by seasons. I think we've gotten spoiled with blueberries year round in our grocery stores and other food year round in our grocery stores. We've gotten really out of touch from the seasonality of what grows when, what reproduces when, um, when are some plants more vulnerable than others because we don't know the seasons. So we're gonna talk about some things that you can be doing right now, March and April. If you know you have barberry or euonymus or multiflora rose and you can identify those, this is a great time to be yanking them out as much as you can. Um, weed wrenches, the weed wrench, which is orange, you still might find one in a gar garage sale somewhere. The original manufacturer quit making those, but somebody else has made a smaller, shorter version called an extractigator. And actually an uprooter too is another rebranding. Someone else is making the bigger weed wrench. So look around for those. It's a little bit of an investment, but if you're on a land trust stewardship crew, um, you need a couple of these. Or pickaxes work too. If you want to use a pickaxe, um, you know, pulling them out chained to a truck is something we did in Kansas. I'm not sure that's good for the soil either. But the whole point about a weed ranch is you go in and you clamp to the base of these woody plants. They seem to be less brittle in the spring, but they're still on the brittle side. And you gently rock them back and forth out while the soil is moist. And our native plants aren't up yet. So that's why you can see these things and you can work them out. And the smaller they are, get them, get them when they're small and just keep working away at them. The other thing is pull out seedlings now and realize that little plants look different 
than adult plants sometimes. Like on my glove over there are little baby bittersweet seedlings. I can see them where the birds were sitting on my tree, juniper tree, pooping them out in a straighter line than I realized. Uh, or if, if you have a fence, that'll happen too. But there's this, they have the characteristic orange roots and these little seeds, the little leaves come up right at the top. Look for them, Google pictures of them. And if it has orange roots, it's a bittersweet. Go ahead and get it out of there. It's, same thing with garlic mustard. Um, we'll talk in a minute more about it. It's a biennial. It's a two-year plant. If you can pull the young ones out, go ahead and do it. Uh, don't obsess about it if you don't get to it because there's other ways to continue combating them in their life cycle. And the wine, the rose wine again, is, or wine rose, is uh, easy to pull out when it's young. And the bottoms of the leaves are silvery, um, that fuzzy little um, spines on the stems, those you can get out. I love my New Englander weeder tool. I don't think I put a picture of it in here. Or you can wait in, until the wine rose gets much bigger and still continue to pull it out, particularly um, in moist soils because it doesn't root real heavily. But just get those things out of there when you can. They're weeds, they're competing with what you wanna grow. And there's mugwort sprouting up there as well, right next to it. So a little bit later in the summer, let's hope you took off time to go to the beach. Memorial Day, had good times and fun. Planted something on Mother's Day weekend. You don't have to be pulling weeds every weekend. Garlic mustard. Make sure you cut the seeds off. And they're very characteristic. You can see them. Get out that plastic bag and cut them off. Don't let them escape into your environment. So that's more of kind of a June-ish frame. Once they dry out, they're going to start popping and scattering all over the place. But this is your second chance to get that garlic mustard. And whether or not it's invasive, if you don't like it and you don't want it in, in your yard, don't let it go to seed. So um, Larry Weiner was very much about don't pull up the weeds, you're, you're wakening the seed bank, which may be other weed seeds, just go in and cut stuff off and let the ground covers that you want crowd up over them. So cockle burrs are disgusting once they dry out. And I just ruined a sweater over the weekend, um, <laughs> tackling a dead one and removing the seeds. I should have changed clothes quickly and gone back out and had gotten it. This is a nightshade with the lily yellow tomato weed seeds on it. It's technically not on the Connecticut invasive plant list, but it grows about two feet tall and I hate it and it's in our neighborhood. So when it comes to, if I haven't cut the plant off earlier in the year or pulled it out, I definitely make sure I go out and collect all those little to poisonous tomato-like fruits. Uh, it is a cousin of the invasive bittersweet nightshade with the pretty purple flowers and the little hanging red fruits. You wanna remove those seeds too. So. Some could call it lazy gardening, some could call it gardening by the seasons, but it's all a matter of making sure you get the plant before it goes to seed, if seed, especially if it's its primary means of vegetative spread, or of, not vegetative, but of spreading. So mile a minute vine, it is on the prowl, it is spreading, it's an annual, so it's not the roots that you're worried about, it's these blasts of little blue seeds. And you will see that herbicides are recommended for spraying them, but you need to get them sprayed by about June because they're flowering and seeds are setting. And I don't know if anybody else realizes this, but you know, glyphosate is very effective as a systemic herbicide contact. It will kill what it touches, it gets sprayed on, it gets sucked back into the plant. But once a plant has produced fruits and seeds, if you spray glyphosate on them, all you're doing is help drying them down. Glyphosate Roundup is approved as a, as a desiccant on grain crops. It has a food tolerance, a food residue tolerance. And so if you're spraying too late in the game with glyphosate, you're releasing a chemical into the air, you're paying money for it, 
and you're not killing the seeds. It doesn't get sucked back into the seed and kill the seed off. So, which is very frustrating. So here we have this uh, mile a minute vine that we are gonna have to be tackling, removing and watching in our neighborhood. We reported it on the website still um, that you can search it up on SIPWIG. But this is just a frustrating one. Stay ahead of this now so it doesn't take over as much as everything else. And if you're in an area that are gonna have shade trees, it wants and needs sun. So eventually it's gonna have some competition from shading plants over it, but it's gonna have a heck of a run in the meanwhile. So this is something that you have to bag and put in a plastic bag once the seeds are set. If you get it before the seeds, uh, are set before it flowers, it's not gonna reproduce vegetatively. So it could go in your compost bin. Um, which brings me to knotweed, my nemesis. Um, I'm gonna run through a couple of slides here. We had this program that I started in 2022 out of exasperation, COVID hit, everybody was shut in at home, including parents and children going to school remotely. My traveling spouse no longer needed to travel anywhere. So we were all stuck in the house together. And my friend, Petey Reed had been practicing this method of carbohydrate deprivation, of cutting back knotweed repeatedly uh, and making sure that the cuttings did not get into the environment. And she said, it works, Suzanne, it really does work. I'm like, fine, every day of the week, I'm driving my kids to soccer or ballet or something. And I'm literally watching it grow along Route 156 and Old Line. It's spreading every year I can see it. 2022, it was like, aha, this is my moment. I'm gonna organize people to groups of people to get together to chop back the knotweed three times over the growing season testing out further and following what Pete had already been doing for the past 10 years, seeing if we could further document how this works. And it was a, it was a great social gardening activity. It, we had so much fun getting together in the evenings about uh, once a week and just snipping away at different pieces at three or four different sites. We're now coming into our third year and we're seeing good results of it. I'm looking for others to, to participate and help document in their settings how this works if it works or not, and what plants come back. So here is knotweed at various stages of growth. You're gonna see it popping up in the next couple of weeks, these little small plants, innocent looking, and then all of a sudden these big stems start coming up that look like bamboo. It's called Mexican bamboo, but it's flimsy and lousy. It's not a true bamboo. It's gonna keep growing over the summer. It's gonna shade everything else out above it and it's gonna bloom in August if undisturbed, okay? And then the first frost is going to kill it. So it's a problem because it has so many positive traits back when we thought it was gonna be this wonder um, horticultural plant. And actually um, explorers brought it back in the 1800s. Botanists brought it back to Europe, to England and to North America. Guess what the predator is um, that's already here in North America, not that we like it, Japanese beetles. They'll eat your knotweed, but they eat my roses and everything else in my yard first and put grubs in my lawn. So I don't think Japanese beetles are gonna be the biological control. There, there are some biological controls being tested now and I can't wait to see how those turn out. But meanwhile, there are ways that you can combat this stuff in your own yard or across the street from your yard or in your land trust preserved property. This is what it looks like after the first killing frost. It's one of the first plants to go because it's, it's a, a tender perennial, I guess you'd call it. The root balls stay alive under the ground, but everything above ground goes dead with the first frost. And of course, it's definitely killed off as it freezes over the winter here in New England. Not exactly pretty to look at. It's everywhere across our continent. Uh, it's a real problem around railroad tracks and, and roadsides, Maine, Canada. It's just thriving well here. It, it originally started in Japan. That's its native habitat. It grows on riverbanks and sloping areas. It's a food crop over there. 
it, but it's it, in, in England, there's a bit of a panic. Uh, if it's in your property, in your ground, you are not going to be, you have to go through eradication methods before you can get a mortgage to sell your property. You have to certify that you don't have not weed on it. And the problem is, is the vegetative cuttings are spreading. It will spread through seeds as well, but it's worse how it just gets a toehold and the, the roots go 20, 30 feet away and shoot up through the tarmac uh, in somebody else's yard. So Pine Grove uh, is a little lovely beach community in Niantic. This is where Petey Reed and Abby Stokes started this project over 15 years ago now. They said, you know, we have this sloping hillside above the Niantic River. We don't want to use any pesticides. It's going to run right down in to Smith Cove. We're going to start chopping this stuff back three times a year. The first year, it was easily 12 to 15 feet tall. It was an intimidating effort. The point is, and they didn't rush right back in that year and plant native plants. They said, let's see when some sunlight gets in, what comes back on its own and realize that we're gonna be traipsing around here on this site for at least two or three years. We'll definitely wait through the first year and not try to reseed. Um, if, a, if there's a concern of an erosion problem, you may wanna look at scattering some straw down. You may wanna look at netting at the bottom or something, but they were able to, they did not have that immediate problem the first year that they did it. They made it very friendly and simple. Um, you need sharp clippers, you need gloves, and you put the stuff in a black plastic bag. And we'll, we'll get to that more in just a minute. But it, it has been the recognized recommendation. Master gardeners learn in Connecticut that you take your invasive plant propagules, your seed parts, and you stick them in a plastic bag and you put them in the incinerated waste stream. Well, that's okay, except if it's the whole plant, then it's a, um, that's a lot of bags. That's a lot of plastic, but it does work. Um, also, make sure bug spray, sturdy boots. I've never been bitten by a deer tick when I'm in knotweed, uh, where I've gotten deer ticks other places, but I also spray up. And the best times you cut back, um, they said, let's let people live their lives. So let's just identify these three time windows. Wait till it grows enough. It's going to come out around Mother's Day. Um, but as long as you get it cut by June 10th or so. So anywhere there late May into Memorial Day weekend, early June, do the first cutting. You're going to be exhausted. It's really big. It's tall, especially the first time. Come back in mid-July. You'll be frustrated to see that some sprouted back, but it won't be quite as prolific. It'll be a flush of growth because you've broken the apical dominance. The top stem is gone, so a lot of little side shoots. By the time you come back and cut it the third time in mid-August, it probably has not had time to bloom yet. What you don't want to do with a plant like knotweed or anything else that's a crazy vegetative reproducer is to use a filament weed whacker because that just shreds it into little pieces. If you try to dig it up, you'll drive yourself insane and um, you may actually be awakening the roots. We're really not sure, but uh, broken roots tend to want to re-sprout. They want to survive. And the whole point about handling them with pesticides, yes, that's an option, but so many times on steep slopes up next to water, if it's in a smaller space in an area, if you just be pragmatic and come back and keep cutting it, you're going to have much the same effect. Um, so, and, and you're learning about what's growing on, going on in the yard and what's growing. They started small, 100 feet by 40 feet, and organized volunteers to do this on weekends, get together. It was a community event, a number of community events. You can see right above Smith Cove there. The, by the third year, that same stretch, you're in midsummer, the knotweed is not coming back. Well, it's small, it's short, it's maybe 18 inches tall. Virginia creeper, you've got flocks, um, Rebecca were in there. So now some people come in and had planted their daylilies and other things like that. They didn't dissuade them from doing that. Oh, there's some bittersweet in there as well. But look at the market difference. So that's three years that was cutting three times. And five years, look how they've reintroduced the native plants. It put, put down this, the flowering plants at the top of the hillside. 
um, the asters, there's some Shasta daisies too, it looks like in there, um, Breedbeckia, just let this stuff, it'll drift down the hillside. The flowers will reseed themselves. And the pitch pines that naturally grow in Pine Grove also were able to thrive better. So given that it was like, okay, PD, I finally have time in my hands, we're gonna do this. We popped up a website, but not a website. We have no money, so we popped up a free Facebook page. We turned on a YouTube channel and we started posting pictures saying, let's have a Nix the Knotweed party. Meet me at the Lime Art Academy. We got their permission, of course. Um, on such and such date, um, thunderstorms cancel, bring the following things. Let's, let's get together, let's have a party. And it kind of went wild. Um, other groups decided to join in. I've been communicating with people from Canada, Toronto to um, Newfoundland, uh, down to Maryland. West Virginia, they've got a real knotweed problem in parts of Pennsylvania, as well as Vermont, New Hampshire. And uh, so we had this cadre of people trying this method. Now, if you're living somewhere where it's, you've got open space, I love the questions going, can I just burn it, Suzanne? I'm like, well, if you're in New Hampshire, probably, but please check with your local um, fire authorities. Uh, an old line, they're not you know, wanting us to do open burning of invasive plant piles, but that all depends on what your local town rules are. And if you have big enough property that you can pile it up, you are very fortunate. Just keep an eye on it. So the sites we picked were nonprofit public places, the Lyme Art Association. They had they have a friends of group, but they're friends of artists. They're not friends of the grounds. So we said, we have some gardeners that will come and help cut there. Behind Old Lyme Town Hall, right above the marsh, we decided to tackle that area. And then also Old Lyme Land Trust had been following this practice. It just started about the time that we did too. So you can see every time we cut it, it gets smaller. Now, again, you may have more shoots growing out, but that's just the plant exhausting itself and growing. So you start with big long handled loppers so you don't have to bend over quite so much. Um, and as you go, start using smaller and smaller hand clippers. But look at all the bags that we were amassing of, of knotweed cuttings. We didn't really like that, but we were trying to figure out how to kill them off. So we decided to try to tarp them and see if we could cook them in the tarps laying on top of the gravel driveway with the other bags weighting down the tarps, why not? Um, so while that was going on, while Lime Art Association's parking lot was closed during the summer of 2020, we were able to pick up a lot of space in their parking lot with tarps of, of knotweed cuttings. This is the beautiful setting that we saw by September. And you see, we have some of these had already been there and obviously were coming back. Joe Pieweed, a cardinal flower. Um, the ferns were coming back in. A lot of native asters popped up. And again, we did see some other invasive plants coming in. A lot of the grasses that first came back were foxtail. Um, we, wild ones came in and did a botany hike and helped us identify what was growing there, what we're looking at. So we can't wait to sit down and actually look at the videos and photos that we shot and map out, okay, at this point, this area had the following species. A year later, it had the following species. This is very much citizen science on the fly, well intended, but we're, uh, we're trying to document as much as we can so we can set up more of a protocol. And here we are by two years into this, and you can see, the native plants are coming back and the knotweed looks like hmm, a short perennial plant growing there. But don't be fooled. If you don't keep cutting it for a couple more years, it will grow out beyond those other plants. And the nice thing is here, by the time it's this small, the other plants are coming back. We're beyond herbicides because it would be very hard to spray the low vegetation. We don't want to disturb what is coming back. Here's where we started at Vest Field in Niantic next to the Oswegatchie Hills Nature Preserve. We've got a slope that's just been taken over next to the baseball field. Big tall plants the first year, wrapped them up in plastic, trimmed the whole hillside. Uh, they said, we're tired of plastic bags. So they went out and bought a bully bag and stuffed all of the knotweed in that, put a tarp on it and we've watched it die down. 
we're monitoring how long does it take to kill knotweed so it won't re-sprout back. Did not have erosion problems here. We were keeping an eye on it though, just in case. And this year we're gonna definitely throw down some grass seed and other things. Um, somebody went in at my encouragement and threw in pumpkins because we found out that some people in Pennsylvania said cucurbits have an allelopathic pat effect on knotweed. The only problem is deer eat the cucurbits. So their pumpkin patch project was short-lived, but we said, well, let's in the fall, let's go smash pumpkins in our knotweed patches. So we'll see if what pumpkins come sprouting this spring and how they survive. Here's another little area where a little town park that we have cut back small patches to stop them from taking over the whole little strip of land because we need to hold, use that land to hold kayak regattas every August on the Nyanic River for Nyanic River Appreciation Day. So we're, we're introducing with the public town public works and environmental department, some native plants growing there uh, around where we're cutting um, the knotweed back. So let me fast forward to the next challenge that we have. Um, we have a real problem in Connecticut that we have a waste crisis. And if you Google Connecticut Mirror, you can follow along the discussion about what's gonna happen with Mira the waste incineration plant in uh, Hartford. It is shutting down in July. The frustrating thing is a third of our municipal waste, the stuff that goes in the bags, that goes in our bins is organic matter. 22% is food scraps. Another 10 or 11% is other green stuff. No, you don't put grass clippings in your trash but there might be some other stuff, invasive plant parts and other things that end up. We have to figure out ways how to get that wet green stuff out of the trash stream that could be incinerated. Other incinerators are still, you know, trash to energy still functioning across the state. Mira is not being rebuilt or replaced. Um, so we're actually looking at, I'm in the Mira region, my town, we're, we're faced with possibly the next five years having our municipal trash hauled to landfills in other states. I mean, why use fossil fuels to haul organic plant materials to a land trust in another state where those organic materials could be invasive plants? And if, why are our watermelon rinds and corn husks in the summer going to another state? That doesn't need to happen. So we have to look at ways to compost our food scraps. We have to look at ways to um, keep the carbon local when it comes to invasive plant materials. So uh, we decided, okay, we're going to try drying knotweed ourselves. We had a lucky opportunity that the Lime Old Lime Food Share Garden said, we're trying to solarize mugwort and they're two miles away. I said, fine, we're, we're going to haul our knotweed to lay on top of your mugwort and we're going to solarize our stuff on top of your stuff. And uh, we found the knotweed dried, died down pretty quickly in the heat of the summer. It's just a hassle hauling it. You didn't want any pieces flying out on the road. I don't know how well their mugwort did. I hope that our knotweed didn't, you know, keep their mugwort alive, but they had to, they went ahead and put raised beds all over that space anyway. So I've lost my storage area, but, but this worked. So if you have an area where you can pile you're not weed and keep an eye on it along with your other invasive plants, do that. But most of us don't have that area, um, certainly not on small lots. So we're talking about how do you get rid of invasive plants? And we've been brainstorming some different things. Uh, vermiculture, worm composting, that could work for food waste. That also could work for invasive plant waste. There might be opportunities there. A lot of people have opinions about goats, whether they have any experience with animal husbandry or not. I've talked to a lot of goat herders. Now, I grew up raising Angus cattle. I don't know about goats, but I hear that some goats bloat if they eat too much knotweed. So we have to be realistic. Um, perhaps invasive plants, some could go into the steam treated food waste stream uh, if we started recycling food, uh, composting food anaerobic digesters or biochar. And we have an exciting opportunity happening in Old Saybrook. I don't wanna say it too, about, too much about it yet because permits are finally being approved for it, 
but a couple of young entrepreneurs are hoping to um, start up a biochar facility in Old Saybrook uh, in May. And their primary feedstock to produce the biochar will be wood, woody products, wood chips, tree stumps, um, trimmings, and they will take invasive cuttings as well. So we're just in negotiations now and figuring that all out, how it could be transported. Uh, would it be donated? Would it be free? Would there be a cost involved with it? But we are, we'll be gearing up in the next couple of weeks to relaunch Nix the Knot Weed for 2022. We encourage more people to try this method. Uh, I'd love to see if four cuttings in the summer are better than three. Uh, I'd, I'd love to see if people do have goats and want to try feeding some to their goats at their own risk. We'll talk. Can there be, does anybody want to try worm composting? Um, and the other thing that we're really curious, the cutting cycles that we had recommended that PD had felt worked were up to August 20th would be the last cutting because the nutrients are going back into the roots. How late can we push that? Um, will you still be stunting the growth enough and starving the plants if your last cutting is September 1? We kind of need to do some side-by-side -side comparisons to see, uh, can we tweak the methodology? Will it work um, other ways as well? So um, that's where we are. As you can tell, I obsess a lot about knotweed, but it's honestly a very enjoyable social activity. No thorns, no itchy sap. It is a food crop. Um, and it's a pleasant experience working together, coming back and seeing what does come back. And then as we're going to start having seeding parties um, in this second and third year, is we, we move on to learning about the native plants that we should be adding back in. So. Wow, Suzanne, that was great. You are the first speaker to end at one o'clock on the nose. Ever. Wow. I'm really impressed. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. That was great. We've we've got some uh, questions in the chat. Um, yes. And so I noticed that uh, Petey um, has been on here answering some questions. So that's been really helpful. Oh, uh, so Petey Reed from Perennial Harmony Land Care, um, uh, who's been involved with this concept from the beginning. And so she's been hopping on and helping people to answer questions, which is great. Um, but one of the first questions that came in was um, when you were talking about um, bittersweet, managing bittersweet, um, do you, is there a risk of mixing up native bittersweet versus invasive bittersweet? Well, everything that I've read on it is like, oh, it's already happened to the point that it is. Um, I, I would say... If you want to pull up an ID app that shows you the difference between the two of them, and so you can learn to identify the two, the native, kind of like native Phragmites, um, that's less prolific than the invasive stuff. They hybridize with each other. Um, chances are, if you're cutting out bittersweet that's strangling your trees on the perimeter of your property, that's the invasive stuff. So, uh, and, I, and I, I welcome others to respond to that. And we can do some more research on that. Um, I, I think the horse is already out of the corral on, on that one. And I, I think you can still find native bittersweet if we we're gonna ever try to reintroduce it, but we're overrun with the other. Hmm. Okay, so uh, that there's been a couple of uh, folks in here. Here's one uh, I read that putting hardware cloth down over it after getting rid of the above ground portion uh, is one low maintenance way to get rid of it. Um, not we keep trying to grow up and then they exhaust themselves by girdling themselves as they're coming through the crop. Yeah, yeah there's, I've seen a number of reports on that. Um, about a year or so ago, somebody up in Vermont had posted something about, oh, I saw this method. I haven't tried it myself, but it looks really promising. I've not tried it myself. So uh, other people, <laughs> I, I'm cheap. I didn't want to have to go out and buy this stuff. And then I'm like, well, is it really going to stay on the ground? Am I going to have to like tamp it down on the sides or put rocks around it? Plus I'm working on steep, slopey, rocky places. 
And um, the last thing I want to try to do is to lay a, a wire grid on top of something. But if you've got a flat area, if you've got it, you know, next to your house, there was somebody in Massachusetts is like, hi, we bought a house. We moved out to the country. What is this? Mm -hmm. You know, the previous owners didn't tell me that's this was here. You know, that might be a perfect place to try that. So, again, I've not seen side by side comparisons, but I've seen anecdotal where people are like, yeah, and it didn't push up out of the way. Well, Suzanne, okay. uh, Petey's uh, response to that later on was that, um, you know, when you're trying to get the native seed bank to come back, um, you might be blocking, you know, restoration on that site, which is a good point, so. Right, right, the foxtail grass is gonna come up marvelously through the, <laughs> through that, but some other vines and other things might have issues, yeah. Um, and then Dan said uh, he cut twice last year and used a foaming spot applicator with glyphosate on the fresh cut stems with the second cutting. He's going to be watching closely for new growth over the next few years. So um, looks like a lot of folks are in this uh, um, uh, kind of wait and see. And then uh, Gay Gasser said that um, uh, uh, she cut her, her yard um, three, let's see. I've cut my knotweed every month. Is that too much? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, <laughs> never too much, probably. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's like if it's your obsession and it annoys you that much, I don't think it's too much. If that's what's really bugging you, then do it. But I'm like, I want to go do other stuff, you know. Um, so what I've been impressed with is the idea that you let it grow up enough, you, you think like a deer, you let it grow up enough, you cut it off, you let it grow up again, you cut it off. <laughs> so that's why I'm really curious about the idea, um, uh, how, how early are the nutrients going back in to the soil and how much of it, because this is such a fast growing plant, how much are we really frustrating this plant? and exhausting it. So. Um, it someone else uh, commented that about vermiculture, um, that, does, that does not kill the seeds, apparently. Okay, so see, that's, that's a problem. I'm, I'm not a vermiculture person. I tried to have a bucket of worms underneath one of my, my kitchen cabinet 10 years ago and my husband overruled and we don't do that anymore. So <laughs> if I have other people can try it, fine. But that's the amazing thing. We talked with Roger Tory Peterson Estuary Center of Connecticut Audubon. They said, you know, right, some seeds have to pass through a wildlife's gut to stratify them. You know, so um, just don't assume that something can be eaten and will be um, rendered inert, you know, right. killed off. Yeah. Um, so Amanda wants to know if wineberry has wildlife value, should it always be pulled out in the yard? That I don't know. I figure there's enough wineberry everywhere else that I'd rather plant things that don't annoy me so much as wineberry. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot prettier, nicer things. There are fruit that actually bear decent fruit that you can actually eat so i would i would get rid of it in the yard it, there's plenty of it growing elsewhere okay um let's see what about pouring some roundup in the hollow stem after cutting i'm sorry i just read another message what <laughs> say that again uh what do you think about pouring roundup in the hollow stem after cutting so I know that's been recommended by some and uh, injecting it into the root. So I've not had experience with that. That's certainly getting down into the root of the plant. Um, I'm Again, I am cheap and, and it was like, if I'm bending over to cut off the plant, then why am I bending over to spray the plant to treat the plant. But I will say that I, I've read that in Mazepic, which was manufactured, discovered and manufactured by one of the companies I work for, American Cyanamid Company, is a very effective control on knotweed. If you cut it first in the spring, you can apply that near the end of the growing season. I think the standard practice is cut in the spring, um, spray in the fall with a 
either straight glyphosate or glyphosate and mazepir or mazepic combination. Okay. Um, and Tim wants to know what native plants can be planted where knotweed has been growing to compete with the knotweed and how many years later do you want to plant the native plants there? So the rule of thumb is don't go out and plant a big one gallon anything right after you dig out, you know, cut off the knotweed because that one gallon plant's not going to survive and you're probably going to step on it the next time you come back. Wait till the second year and, and introduce seed plug. Then you're spreading out your risk of little plants surviving uh, and they're smaller. You can plant more of them. It'll be less expensive. What grows there depends on what are the conditions once the knotweed is cut down. Is it truly a sunny area? Then choose plants that would grow in that area. If it's still kind of a semi-shade area, you need to choose plants that would grow in a semi-shade area. What we found at Lyme Art Association, the grounds right here with these people, asters came back immediately, wild lettuce came back. So let that first year be an observation of what's there in the seed bank. Um, somebody, I have not tried, I don't know if PD has, uh, throwing down partridge berry, which people have used as kind of a transition plant on a meadow because it's a nitrogen fixer. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's a good one. And that, uh, Kind of goes along with one of these questions here. Uh, would that be partridge pea be a good plant to crowd out a slope uh, in full sun? Um, so if you had a full sunny slope, um, what would you put there? Would, would partridge pea be one of those? I would go first with partridge pea. Might plant some mountain mint at the top of the hill and let it start seeding down the hill um, you know, hmm. early on. Um, cause it's kind of one of those nice, aggressive native plants. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. It's, uh, let's see, Pauline wants to know a little bit more about biochar. Is there any use for it? Oh, I want to know about biochar. So you can, you can come and have a panel talk about biochar. I really think that's going to be the next new area. Um, the idea is of putting it back in soil as a soil treatment. So the company in Old Saybrook, I don't think they right now see themselves as being a retailer of biochar. They might be a wholesaler of biochar with other people to figure out what to do with it. If, if we can come up, I say we, they, if somebody can come up with um, cost-effective means of producing biochar, then we can start looking at it as an organic compound, carbon, putting back in soil. Mm -hmm. um, so... This, that's a whole new emerging area. That's great. Very interesting. We, we look forward to hearing more about that. Uh, I can link you up with some people who know. I, I don't know the answers, but I want to find out. We'll have to do a, a lunch and learn on it. You're right. Um, and Lucille says she loves your volunteer efforts. Um, do you have any experience with using town resources for things like uh, erratic, your eradication efforts? <laughs> oh, I can tell you stories. So, uh, so it's easier to corral a bunch of master gardeners. And if you're doing something on public property or nonprofit organization property, then check with your master gardener for your county or region and see if you would qualify to organize volunteers because they have to do X numbers of hours every, every summer. Um, so that's the easier route. Um, when it comes to towns, it all depends on your own town's risk aversion. Um, how many engineers versus plant people are on your town staff? <laughs> um, we, we got into great discussions be, be behind the old Lime Town Hall. Was like, I said, we're going to, can we try this organic method? I'll provide the volunteers. Fine, Suzanne. When do we get to spray the Roundup? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, later later you know so i got a lot of opinions from people who thought we were nuts uh doing what we were doing getting together every once in a while in the backyard after work and doing that so it really depends on their openness and willingness old saybrook solid waste coordinator jim therian is really gung-ho on the food scrap recycling and and old saybrook is definitely interested in the idea of sequestering invasive plants in their own separate pile especially if you can go right to the biochar thing one mile down the road 
And we're looking into that in old Lyme as well. So you're gonna find different silos of expertise in your town. If you've got a strong waste management crowd that's really into treating waste as waste, not as recyclable carbon, they're probably not gonna to wanna to get into thinking about how plants work and, and interact. They wanna get it hauled off to some industrial incinerator somewhere. Mm -hmm. so it depends. Be patient, go in and ask, see what they're willing to do. We're, I'm looking for an area that somebody has an old silage pit. I'm from Kansas farm. It's, a, it's gonna be a concrete area that drains well that you could toss the invasive cuttings into keep and sequester them and keep them away. If you have a space like that, an old building foundation or something, or an industrial parking lot area that can be monitored, these would all be great die down, die off, dry out areas. But it depends on the willingness of the public work staff to say, yeah, I can sequester some space for that, or we don't have that, so. Okay, so it looks like we have uh, maybe one or Two more questions. Um, Ellen uh, McCormick was uh, uh, recommending not to use glyphosate near the water or on slopes that lead to the water. Um, right. And you probably won't be able to grow anything there for a while. So, right. So, so glyphosate kills what it hits. Glyphosate, it, it does not have any residual activity on the soil. And Mazapir and Mazapic do have residual activity. So if you spray these combos of herbicides and you don't understand what's in the mix, you could be killing things off for a longer period of time. There are pre-emergence, there are post-emergence. I could, again, I don't wanna go into all the details on it, but that's why I really think people in their own backyard really ought to try some of this mechanical stuff first. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, we grew up thinking you could spray Formula 409 spray on everything and it would go away. Or Windex, you know, my big fat Greek wedding. No, um, it doesn't work that way. If <laughs> Try the mechanical. You do have to be persistent about it. I've had some people come back to me, probably pay for by the chemical industry saying you are pr promoting the idea to start doing something that's only going to perpetuate the plant to grow more. And it's like, no, I don't, I don't think so. From the standpoint, anytime you cut back a plant, it is going to come out with a flush of more growth. You are taking carbohydrates away from it. So just go back and keep cutting it again. Again, think like a deer yeah. <laughs> eating your favorite plant. So, so that the last kind of comment or question here is an interesting one between um, PD and a willow search um, heard that biochar may help with jumping worms. So that's a whole nother, uh, whole nother lecture topic. Jumping oh. worms and biochar. <laughs> yeah, and I can answer this question myself. Suzanne, how is your own garden now? I would say it's very neglected. <laughs> <laughs> My problem is it's much more fun to garden with other people in other spaces. <laughs> And my vegetable garden has now become a rhubarb, uh, asparagus, grapes, raspberries, and garlic that I forgot to harvest bed. You know, I, I, I joined a good CSA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's what mine looks like, too. I won't even go out because, and you even said the other day, just go after the invasives. You said this in your talk. Go after the invasives, leave your, let your garden sleep for a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I do see Jana has commented here, you've tried this for five years and it's still growing. And, and um, if you want to send me some, some pictures of it, we can talk more about the specifics of the site and the situation. I mean, this is the thing, it's not going to all go away at the end of three years. You're going to have a significant reduction, especially if you start reintroducing other plants but it is an ecosystem. So you're going to have to, we call it roguing. You have to go out and you look for stuff, whether you're spraying chemical sprays or you're doing mechanical. Um, new seeds will blow in. New cuttings will swoosh down the water and land on your property. It's not one and done. It's a live ecosystem. So 
Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Judy's looking at again the picture behind you. She said, <laughs> yeah. "Yeah, I don't know. I was gonna, I was gonna say, what is that? Let Fern me get and grassy ferns and, and something grassy mixed in with. You. Well, that's always the challenge to keep the things that you want and get rid of the, you know, the one bad thing that's in there. Yeah. So the I encourage people go out and use your phone, snap pictures." Um, every, every quarter, every season and keep doing that, um, every year. And it's really interesting. Now I'm like, no wonder my vegetable garden doesn't produce nearly the green beans and other stuff. The trees have grown up too much around it. That's why it's becoming the perennial bed the, that it's becoming. That's great. So, um, just, uh, let's see, Shane is saying we can connect you with Suzanne if you'd like, um, so email Shana at smeyer at aspatucklandtrust.org, uh, or you can um, reach out to Suzanne. And Suzanne has put together a really nice uh, resource sheet, um, which I know Shana sent out to all the registrants today. And um, I think maybe we can put it we can put a link to it in the chat. When we send the recording out to everybody, we will also attach a copy of that resource uh, list. It's got great links on it um, for everybody that will highlight a lot of the topics that Suzanne lectured on today. So Suzanne, is there anything else you'd like to say before we? Um, yeah, I, I didn't try to cover every weed. Everybody's gonna have their certain invasive plant, their bane of existence. So there's just not time for that, but pick one, focus on it. Don't obsess too much on it, but just kind of set a pattern and keep checking in on it every once in a while and, and compare from year to year. Okay, that's that's great advice. And once you get it out of the way, you can start replanting the natives in there. And uh, I just want to let everybody know that um, the Aspatuck native plant sale is opening to the public this Friday, April 15th. Um, we've got a lot of good things to plant there instead of the knotweed once you get rid of that. Um, and so I encourage everybody to kind of look for we, uh, our, our Lunch and Learns next Friday. We have uh, Earth Day and Edwina Van Gaal uh, fr is going to be lecturing for us on two thirds for the birds. Edwina's from uh, the Hamptons and she's going to be talking about really putting that 70 percent of those native plants back into your property for the birds. And so two thirds for the birds. If you buy three new plants, at least two of them should be native. So um, uh, look for Edwina's talk next Friday on Earth Day. And uh, we will let, give everybody um, the recording of this fabulous conversation with Suzanne today. Suzanne, I'm so thankful to you for, for joining us. I've wanted to have you speak uh, for a couple of years now and I'm glad we were able to get you without having to get in your car and come and speak to us. <laughs> and thank you all. I, it's, it's been a pleasure and I'm, I'm glad that my Wi-Fi stayed connected. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Everybody get out and enjoy this spring day and uh, we appreciate your support. Get on the Aspatuck Land Trust website and join us. Get on the green corridor and buy some plants so we can continue to do these uh, educational programs. So thanks everybody for coming on. Take care. Thanks, Suzanne. Bye-bye.